5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. time in your life when you're kind of okay with that like maybe you hit 35 or whatever it is and you're just kind of like I actually don't really want to go to clubs anymore or bars I'm tired of seeing my friends like I would rather just do whatever these kids want to do all the time and some people take kids for that reason Mm. to fill up their time I think that's a that's an interesting strategy (laughs) (laughs) no seriously like my relationship is boring let's get some kids Ah, that's the dumbest reason to get kids I think I do know people people do do that but yeah it's it's easier when you're older and richer though, because then it's kind of like you can outsource a lot of the child stuff. Get a nanny. <laughs> Speaking of outsourcing, I guess we should uh, transition oh. a little bit. Um, okay, so your name is Merlin Comdor. Just get that out of the way since we've been talking now for 20, yeah. 20 minutes or so. Um, and let's see. Okay, so we met two and a half years ago, something like that. It was pre-pandemic. It was at Definitely. a. Was it? It was before the New Year's thing, or the New Year's thing was the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was even before the New Year's thing, and it was not last New Year's, not the one before. So yeah, two and a half years at mm. Janus, Janus's place. Yeah, and that was um, that was interesting because so our my former neighbor here and your friend Janus from you met in college, right? You guys yes. met at university in Maastricht. Yeah, so I uh, did my bachelor in uh, in Groningen, moved to uh, Sweden for half a year, and then. Wasn't sure what what master would suit me, and there was one specialized track, uh, which I didn't give anywhere else in Europe actually, which was a combination of marketing and finance. Mm. And I always wanted to do. I like really like both of them, but I didn't want to be full on finance. I didn't want to be in uh, Excel sheets all day or or just work with numbers and money. And I didn't want to be one hundred percent marketing because it was, in my eyes, only being creative and a bit fuzzy and everything so i wanted to have the the number side of marketing and this was exactly that you could either go um into a bank and do the marketing side of 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 finance or you could do the financial side which i found very interesting financial side of marketing so you could do your marketing but you could show to the to the company okay this is what it is bringing in for the company these are the uh, results you could make it Make make a hard case for your marketing efforts, and that's what I really liked. That's why I chose it. Uh, one year track, I believe they stopped giving the track because it uh. didn't, I'm not sure if it really succeeded. However, everyone that did the masters, uh, they ended up in a really nice position, which they really like. And I'm I think that's quite rare if you if you end up after studies in positions that you really enjoy. So um, I think the track was was a good choice. Decided on that. Um, Actually, I didn't decide on that in the beginning. I started with a, with a controlling master's, uh, so more the finance side. Then I was one month in, in a course, and they gave this big this big event uh, where they showed a PowerPoint. And then the first slide was, why do you go into controlling? Because you lack the charisma of going into uh, into marketing or something like that oh. and everyone was like ha 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 <laughs> and I was like what the fuck am I doing here <laughs> this is not my studies <laughs> so I discovered it was purely about numbers and about uh, scheduling and planning and everything all the things that I'm really bad at um, so the whole planning and and keeping a strict grasp of, of a business or how do you say um, yeah more or less what goes in comes uh, what goes out everything had to be um really well taken care of and be um you could have it shown to the rest of the company so i i quit with that one then i went to marketing finance and that was a really good choice for me um got a friend of mine peters from groningen i convinced him to go as well so together we went to to maastricht and that's where i met janus mm. janus was uh, also joining the marketing finance the same year as i did but he did an extra finance class extra uh, track or finance he did on top of that but that's where we met that's so interesting because um <laughs> you've never we've never actually talked about that before i don't think in at least in that depth and um for me it's a little bit similar because um my degree was in sport management 
And um, within that, you had a built-in business administration minor. And then I got a second minor in history just because I had almost enough credits and decided to just get it. Um, and so when I took my first marketing class, like I, I always knew I liked finance. Like my dad was into the stock market and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I read these Warren Buffett biographies and stuff. I thought about changing my major to finance, but I didn't have good enough grades to get into that uh, program. But when I took my first marketing class in the business school, I was like, holy shit. Like the professor was really cool. It was like an almost 70 year old guy. And he was telling us all these crazy stories. And one day he gave us this full kind of presentation about Vail ski resorts and like all the different things that they did to kind of make Vail so, you know, great and whatever. And it was- Vail is the business name? V-A-I-L, yeah. Vail, yeah. the, you know, okay. in Aspen, they have the huge uh, Vail resorts. And then also I think in the French Alps or something, they have a big Vail park. That's parks. the first time I hear about that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I think they're the biggest company of ski resorts in the world. Okay. Um, but it's like, you know, pretty ritzy, like super. But this was basically kind of about personalization and stuff before personalization was trendy. So like Vail, what they would do back before they even had computers is you would fill out these paper forms about all your preferences and they would store that in these huge folders uh, of nice. files. So then when you came back the next year, everything would be set up for you. Your ski lodge would be exactly how you want it. If you liked coffee, they'd have a coffee maker. If you liked tea, they would have tea there. You know what I mean? Like everything would be. Yeah, it's the same with the hotel chain. Yeah. And I think they were kind of one of the leaders in this of kind of pioneering it. And when he showed us this video about it, I always thought, like you said, marketing was really fuzzy. Marketing was kind of like, you know, the like softer stuff that you don't know where the money goes and that kind of thing. So anyway, long story short, after college, I got a job doing uh, digital marketing sales. And mm. I was really just so not confident in making these sales and stuff that the only way I felt good about making a sales proposal or pitch to these potential clients was to like have this spreadsheet broken down of if you invest this much, then you can possibly get this return if we get this conversion rate and blah, blah, blah. And so that kind of blending, you know, of the finance and the marketing really suited me. Yes. And that was kind of the approach that I took. So turning marketing into an asset instead of expense. That's yeah, Absolutely. Whole and that's kind of what drove really the whole, you know, growth marketing, um, you know, explosion from Facebook and Uber and all that stuff. And, you know, now I think honestly, it's like people call it growth marketing. And if you take out the kind of A-B testing and the hacking stuff, it's really basically about making sure you know your ROI yeah, yeah. And, and knowing all your numbers and your metrics so that you know actually what you're getting out of it. Exactly. And then suddenly you see, wow, this marketing effort brings so much to the company. Let's call it growth marketing. It's so... Grows Let's it so market much. it, make it sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody will want do. it. We can all get raises. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's exactly what happened. And I, I think it's kind of a shame in a way that it's become like a, a subset of marketing because when I was in, you taking marketing courses, we were always taught about ROI and you should always be pursuing ROI and tracking it and all this stuff. But then all of a sudden, I think digital is what, when digital marketing became so big, that's what changed things is because now with the internet, you can yeah. actually track conversions and all these things. Got numbers. Instead of just, you have a tracking number in the phone book and people call your phone book ad and that's how many, you know, new customers you got. Um, but so interesting that you were kind of attracted to that program for the same reasons that uh, I liked that. Yeah, but like you said, the, the example of the ski resorts, that's what I really liked about marketing. You would have all these interesting business cases, uh, think of ways on how to solve this case, how to solve this case. And that's what I lacked with with the pure finance courses. It was all about investments, uh, which I found really interesting as well. But having that combination was was perfect. Yeah. And so another thing that whenever we were, uh, I think one of the earlier times we were hanging out, I think this was in Cologne. Um, so the only thing that I knew about you from kind of like a background or history wise thing was, oh, so actually to go back a little bit, that first day that we met at Giannis's house, yeah. it was me, you, I think Ilko was there. Ilko, <laughs> yeah, Lipko, Lipko. Lipko, Lipko, yeah, sorry. So uh, he was Making there. Making pizzas. And uh, Alma is, was there as well. That's a, not a Dutch guy. So the very first time that we met though, everybody had a laptop and you guys were all working on e-commerce stuff. Correct. Yeah. And I also had at the time two e-commerce uh, websites. And then I was also doing the Weaver English thing, but that hadn't really gone digital yet because mm -hmm. COVID hadn't happened. Um, and so immediately I was kind of like, oh, these guys like speak my language, you know? And so then we're all sitting down we're talking about this stuff. And then, so Giannis had told me at some point that you made a little bit of money from crypto in college, and then you turned that into an Amazon business. But then, so that was basically all that I knew about you, right? Then in Cologne, you were telling the story, you guys were talking about some crazy professor you had back in uh, Maastricht. Yeah, yeah. 
And you were saying something about how in university, you didn't really make great grades. Like you kind of, you couldn't find it in your kind of like motivation or whatever in your focus to kind of keep yourself tied down enough to just be so like focused or whatever to actually make good enough grades and do whatever you needed to do. And your reasoning behind that was very interesting, I thought. I'm not sure if it's the same reasoning, but I have in my head the exact reason. Um, so yeah, what I did was I, I was actually, I was motivated enough to get those grades. So um, I would always, with quite little effort, I would get normal grades enough to, like not sixes, higher than sixes, but not eights, not nines, uh, enough to pass with a, like, okay, this guy is not a only six guy. So I would, I would pass it. And then I would think, especially in Maastricht, like, okay, let's put in effort uh, got the motivation. Let's really study hard, hard, hard and get to those eights and nines. Then I put in all the effort, like crazy amounts, 10 X of what I would normally put in. And I would only get a maximum of, of, of eight instead of a 7.5, for example. So that's when I thought, Hey, if I put in 20% of the effort, I could get a 7.5 instead of putting in 80 or 90% more and get just a slightly higher grade. So I would just decide, okay, this is the time I'm going to allocate to this kind of grade. And that's what I'm going to be happy with. That, I think that's really smart because nobody, <laughs> nobody really thinks about it in that way. You know what I mean? Like in high school, it was different because for us in high school, if you were in the top 10% of your class, then you could, you got automatically accepted into any university yeah. in Texas. Right. So you have this incentive to get into a really good school. But unless you're going to go get a master's or a PhD, and in the U.S., it's way less common to get a master's than it is here, you know, um, there's not a huge incentive to, um, you know, get great grades in university. And so I kind of felt a little bit of the same way. It's like there's so many other things that I could kind of mine was maybe way more out of laziness, I think, than and not just being a good student. But for years, that kind of mindset about it is actually if you're sitting in a job interview talking to somebody and you make that case like. I would be kind of blown away. Like, wow, this guy's smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also, it also has to do with what you want to do after studies, of course. I, I, I had friends that wanted to do a PhD, so they had to get right. uh, cum laude. And yep. I, I knew that was not going to happen for me unless I would put in like even more insane amounts of time. Uh, and I would much rather spend the hours, the, uh, the free time that I would have by putting in only 20% of the effort into building my own business on the side. So that was... For me, a strong case. Um, but yeah, sorry, I just had to think about your, you telling that you entered the room. It's funny that you said it. Uh, and you saw this New Year's party. We were open, opening our laptops, working on, on the That e wasn't the New Year's party. Okay, it, was, it, was it was a different thing where we were just all there <laughs> chilling and supposed to go out later. But, <laughs> no, it but it's, it's, it's fun how I, I also see like, okay, these are my kind of people. When I see people at a social event, so with with laptops. Their laptops are open, yeah. working on their own, their own stuff. Yeah, exactly. There has to be a limit to it, but of course. But I think for us in that kind of moment was like, we enjoy that. You know what I mean? So some people would be like, oh, you're always working or whatever. But that is kind of one of those situations where it's like, it's not actually work. It's more yeah. of like, you might be doing a puzzle to ch k kill time. For me, a puzzle is how do I get more keywords to rank or how do I get, you know, this to happen? That's a good comparison, the puzzle. Yeah. It's like, like solving a puzzle all the time. What I try to compare it to now is um, I, it's, it's just give me motivation to work on my own stuff more, right? Is that I love strategy games on the computer. So like your kind of civilizations, Age of Empires stuff. Like I love those games. Uh, I also love like when I play sports games, I love to play like franchise mode where you're, you know, control the franchise for years. You make trades and draft and all that stuff. What I try to tell myself, which is fairly true, is that building your own business is the real life version of that with real life reward rewards that you can't get from playing those video games. The real life risks, <laughs> real life risk too, which is what makes it fun. But, um, the, the video games and stuff, it's like the sugar, it's like cotton candy. You know what I mean? It feels good. It's instant gratification of yes, conquered the world again. Like, look at me, yeah. <laughs> you know, walk around the house and show no one, <laughs> you know, you can't go to work the next day. Like, man, there's no actual results. Yeah. Like, I won three Super Bowls with the Cardinals, you know, it's, I don't know if you know the blah, blah, blah. And they're like, nobody cares, you know, kind of a big deal in kind the of online a big world. Deal on my PlayStation. <laughs> <laughs> but in real life, if you're kind of able to have that delayed gratification where, you know, like, you know, we were talking about it last time of like, you know, trying to create some new landing pages to rank for some keywords. It's like, 
that's not exactly what you want to be doing, you know, late night on a Thursday or middle of the day on a Saturday. And it doesn't give you any instant gratification because it might take weeks for yeah. the pages to rank or for you to see anything come from that. But as, as I'm getting older and, you know, hopefully more disciplined and learning from other areas of life, I'm kind of putting it more together. Like, no, you got to just consistently put in the work and then stuff from like the Andrew Huberman things we talk about with the neuroscience and whatnot. It's like, I have to learn to let those moments be rewarding in themselves. It's not about the extrinsic reward. It's about thinking at that moment, wow, I feel good about the fact that I just did the work. Exactly. Yeah. People keep on talking about delayed gratification all the time. I, I agree 100%, but it sounds like you're, you're not having that, gratif that gratifying moment when you're doing the work, but I think you can have that moment as well. Even, even if you're doing shitty work, yeah. uh, feel good about you having done it, having put in the work already, having, having achieved what you wanted to do at that day and, and knowing where it will lead in the future, you can feel grateful about that as well. So it's for sure delayed, like bigger gratification at the end. I, you're, I think you're right that delayed gratification is not the best way to put it because um, sometimes it is, right? But at, at the same time, it's more like you don't want to get too addicted to the instant gratification because yeah, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't mean that the two things, I guess, have to be so linked. But Huber, Huberman actually says like it's, you know, scientifically proven that you can attach the dopamine release, you know, like that kind of going after your goals and then getting rewarded for it with your own hormones. Like you can attach that more to the journey, more to the kind of pursuit of it. And it's actually healthier because every time you attach something to a reward, it goes down every single time you get that reward. It's the same mm -hmm. thing when you do a drug or you have sex. It's like, it's never going to feel as good as probably it did that very first time. It always goes down after that. So it's very crucial. And actually our brains are wired to where we can attach dopamine to the process. It's like when I first started going to the gym again, a couple of years ago, like it's very tempting to just think about the body you want or to think about whatever is the, at the end, but that's not sustainable because that's not what's going to keep you going there. You have to like going to the gym or there's no way you're going to keep going. Yeah, true. No, yeah, exactly what you're saying. The, but the, the liking the journey is, doesn't happen instantaneously. When you take a new drug, for example, when you have sex the first time, it's an instant exactly. gratification. That's so what yeah, I mean that, by you have to learn to turn away the instant gratification of like, say, playing the computer game. And like you say, you can have a, uh, obviously you can get gratification out of doing the work on your laptop. It's probably not going to be the same as like a no, video game. But get if a you, big dopamine boost. Yeah, but if you teach yourself and you kind of wean yourself off the other stuff, it's the same thing when you try to have a healthy diet. Like if you go, try to go from sugar to like, let's say you have sugar in your coffee every day. And then you try to go black coffee, cold turkey next day. Not going to work, man, because you're you're wired to need a certain level of sweetness. You have to kind of gradually take yourself down. Most people do at least. Some people can go cold turkey, but you got to do it gradually in order for that to work. So if you kind of over time allow yourself to get gratification out of the, the pursuit, you know, activities, eventually it does actually get much easier and, and you enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not having to mentally trick yourself. So I always wonder how... How do you get this? How do you get this mindset? Because I, when I look at, for example, uh, there's also quite a few successful football players that start a business uh, afterwards, after their career. And when they start a business, man, this business often grows really fast as well. Like this mentality that took them to the top of the football game also takes them far in the in the business world. It's it's it has yeah. to do with the, the, the same delayed gratification again, I working hard on. I think one of the things is that um, as an athlete, you have to, like, athletes don't do a whole lot of wishful thinking. For athletes, it's kind of like, it's very cut and dry, black and white. You know what I mean? Like, you know if you played well or if you didn't play well. You know if a guy's good or if they're not good. And um, I played in this, um, like, uh, I don't know, city league flag football deal in university. And, and, and two of the guys that played on the team were former, like, university players. Um, really good. And like, they had no tolerance for fuck ups. Like if you mess something up, they would just tell you and they would, be, and they had, their expectations were so high for like how you're, so, I'm like, man, I'm just a normal dude out here, you know, like don't expect me to be you. But I think when they go to business, they have that same mindset. Like they don't really tolerate excuses. They don't really want to hear kind of like that it can't be done and stuff like that. It's like, if you say, no, I can't do that. Okay. Find me somebody who can, you know what I mean? Like yeah, at yeah, least yeah. the successful ones, I feel like. 
So it's more a mindset of um, of being h- tough on on yourself and tough on on others, getting them in, instead of delayed gratification. Then, well, if you if you think about a lot of entrepreneurs who start like young, okay, you haven't really figured out yet. Like I think you know, business is just one thing that it doesn't matter what your goals are if it's like fitness or sports or music or whatever, like you have to learn kind of how to be a professional in a way. Like you have to learn work ethic and dedication and meeting goals and all this kind of stuff, like how to not procrastinate. There's this certain level of bullshit you have to get through to learn how to actually accomplish things. And in athletics, it's one of the most kind of uh, supported ways for you to learn those because you have a coach, you have a whole organization and so it's basically like you've acquired the skills and like you just said, now all the, if you just put those skills with some good business sense, yeah. um, then it seems to be a pretty good recipe for success. I was just talking about the same thing yesterday. I went to a like, small event. won't go into details. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> with a friend now of, you have everybody curious. <laughs> with a friend of mine who what did kind of the, pornography uh, conference <laughs> you went to. <laughs> I'll tell you later. Um, <laughs> So a friend who did the same studies as I, same bachelor's as I did. And uh, so international business. Um, and another guy who went to Delft. He did Werktagbauk uh, in English, machine building mm. skills. Uh, and we were talking, and then he said, okay, I did this study in Delft. And then after working for a year or two, I did an MBA. And now I have uh, like a unique combination uh, but I'm really happy I actually learned a skill as opposed to what you guys did. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was thinking, yeah, he's right. And studying business, you don't really learn a, a, you don't have a, a skill, skill or no. something you can apply. It, it's more of a mindset you learn. You yeah. you learn to present, you learn to, you get a business feeling, you learn all these all these things, which I think you will learn if you start a business by yourself as well. You will, you will, you're forced to learn those. So, um, I'm not sure why I drifted off to this, but if I would, I would not per se recommend someone to study business, but just start, start a business. I know. Yeah. It's the fastest way to learn. Also people, a lot of people I saw in my classes during the business, I, I would think yeah, this guy, this girl, I'm not sure if they will get really far or high up in the ranks of a, of, of a particular business because they just have a, a completely different attitude or mindset towards business as I saw with other students that would have maybe not the, um, they wouldn't get the high grades, but they would have a certain mindset that would bring them really far. And now when I look back and I see what, where everyone ended up, it's more or less the true. way that you thought yeah. that it would be. Yeah, I, I agree when I look at, um, cause one of the things that's always kind of interested me is that if I live here for five years and get my permanent residence, I could go basically get a master's for pennies. You know what I mean? Compared to the U S and so, yeah. but I've actually thought that if I was going to do that, it would most likely be a master's in history. Um, only because I find that the most fascinating one to kind of learn about, you know, and be taught from really experienced and smart people business. Like I know people who go get MBAs. I know people that like, you know, get masters and whatever it is. And it's like, I think that's kind of a, I don't want to say waste of time, but it's like not the most efficient use of your time because I think that's one of the reasons why I said that I was really interested when you said that. Um, Actually, the thing that you said that, that I heard you say back in the day about your studies and whatever is that you were interested in so many other things that you mm. would like learn about the stuff in school and then you would kind of want to just do it yourself or you'd want to look into other things. And so you felt like you didn't need to put all your time into just learning the material that they had. Yeah. And mine was the same way uh, related to that. Like I remember reading my, you know, textbooks in in university and then like they would have this kind of uh, example case study about how UPS did X, Y, Z, or how, like I said, what the thing about Vail and how they did this thing. And I would then go on the internet and read for hours about that. And I just want to learn everything about that. And how did they do this? And, um, and that's not helping me pass that exam. Right. You know what I mean? However, it did help me so much in life. Like, most of the stuff that I know now and kind of apply into my business life now was from the stuff that I was exposed to then. From those actual cases also. So yeah. real life stuff as opposed to 
That's what I tell people about. Borders, five forces, or what do you call it? Yeah, the, yeah. Or of status, cultural dimensions. Some, somebody told diamonds. me something about a pestle analysis the other day. I was like, never heard <laughs> oh, of that before. Pestle, yeah, we <laughs> learned that as well. It said that it was a subset <laughs> of a SWOT analysis. I was like, okay, well, I know a SWOT, so maybe that's enough. But but my point is that, um, what was my point? <laughs> oh, my point is uh, that. Case studies. Yeah, like. Oh, when people say to me that, oh, I'm not really sure that, you know, education from university is like worth it or blah, blah, blah. I do disagree with that because I think for me, most of the stuff that I learned is because I was exposed to it in university. It's not your university's job to teach you everything. It's their job to expose you to things. And it's up to you to go dig into it and learn more and do whatever. But I was such a sponge at that time that like, I would just read tons of books. And then in the f- couple of years after, even I was still reading lots of books, you know, listen to audio books, stuff like that, because they educated me. They taught me how to think critically. You know, they taught me how to kind of like see the world from a broader lens per se. Um, and that stuff was invaluable. Like I can't put a number on how that, you know, basically changed my life. But as far as g- once you hit that and now you know how to learn and you know how to get information and stuff like that, there's only so much like more and more and more education is not going to continue exponentially increasing your capabilities. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I agree 100%. University on itself, perfect. The way they teach you how to learn, how to look critically at things, how to do your research, um, what you find interesting, how to basically master, uh, digest stuff efficiently. But you learn that with any other uh study so why not learn for example learn history if you really want to be knowledgeable on that subject or go to delve to a technical subject you learn the same way of looking critically at yeah the stuff they teach so yeah for sure business did expose me i love those uh the harvard business review case studies yeah, those yeah. were really nice I know. Yep. and i did the same thing as you did i looked them up went online just checked how they were going right now how the companies were doing yeah um 100% agree. So for me, the, um, the university was more about cherry picking the, yeah. the classes that I liked, yep. um, applying that stuff that I learned. I, like you said, I wanted to apply it straight away. So I learned it. I, I, I'm always, when I learn something, I, I tend to forget it as well if I don't apply it. So that's why I started the, um, uh, one business during my bachelor's, just an e-commerce store. Um, so I could apply everything I learned during my bachelor's and then sold the business before I went to the, into the, into my master's. Okay. So fir- first talk about what that business was. The first e-commerce the first one. e-commerce this business. This is in your bachelor's still. In the bachelor's. Yes. Um, started first year of the studies. I think, uh, I went, I went to buy, uh, Egyptian shisha, the hookah. Mm. Uh, I went to buy it for a birthday party of a friend of mine. They were gaining popularity in the Netherlands and he wanted one. So I saw this online shop, uh, waterpipeonline.nl, and I saw they had an office in Groningen. I could just cycle there instead of ordering it online. Went into the, went into the office, and then I saw this newspaper article laying on, on their desk, like Egyptian hookahs going crazy in the Netherlands, blah, 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 blah. And I saw these guys two years older than me uh, having started this business, I thought, man, that's awesome. Wow. And they were doing really great. Um, business was booming. So I <laughs> thought, let's copy them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be honest about this. Um, yeah, why, why, not, why start something hard from scratch that you think is a good idea instead of just look, looking at a proven uh, idea and doing it better? So this was my whole task was just setting up e-commerce uh, applying what I've learned during my studies and just making a better competitor, uh, beating that guy where I just purchased my my first uh, shisha mm. uh, and uh, and trying to beat them. So yeah, set it up together with a friend of mine, Lipko. Um, we started up the, the e-commerce, used something like Zencard, I don't know. Um, but this, then I noticed like how each small step opened up a whole new world of interest. Uh, I think you can relate. Absolutely, with the, yeah. The, I started Zencard. You had to configure everything in, in PHP, HTML. I knew nothing about it. Just started writing, seeing what worked, what didn't work. Uh, I still can't code, but I, I could do enough to to make all the changes I wanted to the website. Yeah. Just like copying and pasting and hacking. And, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mainly, 
exact uh, going to other websites where you where you saw something that worked, uh, copying their code, yep. pasting it in your yeah. website. It was it used to be much it. easier to do. Now it's yeah. quite difficult, but yeah, it was easy. Um, I think I even used front page. Do you still know it? I know front page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a long, long time ago. Um, so yeah, but then the whole thing about it, doing it together with a friend, uh, every time we saw each other for the studies, we would show the progress and it was really exciting. Yeah. So I, I noticed like, okay, this is, this is what I want to do in my, in my free time. Definitely. Um, continued building out, building it. And, uh, we got orders that, like the first order was extremely exciting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> started packing it straight away. And we did everything ourselves. Going so we to the did car the, dealership, uh, picking out a car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Scrolling for houses online. <laughs> um, but yeah, so exciting that someone you don't know went to your websites, found you on Google. That's the exciting part. You didn't. We didn't do any advertising. We only did organic uh, search engine ranking. Um, found you online, decided on a. They would trust your website. And then purchase something crazy. And we, yeah. we didn't even have like a warehouse or anything. We just had a few boxes in our own house. So we packed it, shipped it, um, got a few orders per day, but it never grew, never grew to where I'm not sure where it could have been, <laughs> <laughs> but it just never grew. Um, we got like, um, I think 10 orders a day. Now, nah, yeah, 10 orders a day. Um, we would still pack it with the two of us. I would hire my sister, would hire my brother, <laughs> would hire a friend of my brother, just rotate between all the freelance freelance work. Um, but it taught us so much. And and then at the end, I had to do all the accounting myself as well. So that's when it all lined up with the study perfectly. Second year, we got accounting classes. Oh, wow, now I can apply these lessons to to the whole business. Did the whole accounting, uh, realized we had two, two euros of profit at the end of the year. <laughs> Two more than most people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were profitable from the start. <laughs> My friend's joking. If I could buy a pack of chewing gum from all that profit I got for the year. Um, so, but I didn't care. It wasn't about the profits. It was about applying all the, all the knowledge. Um, but then after my bachelor's, when I went to Sweden, um, and we decided to, to take turns in who led the company. So I was in Sweden. Didn't want to mind the business. He would, Luca would take over and he would go on exchange half a year later to uh, Germany. I would take over. But then we realized, okay, our interests, our interests are somewhere yeah. else now. Uh, we're not going to grow this anywhere meaningful. So let's, uh, let's sell it. And then um, we, we just contacted all the competitors in the, in the space. One guy from The Hague, really nice guy. Uh, he was owner of premium hookahs. So he sold premium all the, hookahs the good, sounds the good like stuff. premium hookahs. So I feel like he's like <laughs> double dipping there. <laughs> Web traffic. It did seem like a guy who, who would also do that. Don't hope he's watching, but, um, <laughs> but my he, show's not that big yet. So. <laughs> this guy was more into, uh, that's what I found fascinating as well. Having gone through this experience, I went to visit him and I looked at his, how he set up the business. He, wasn't making much profit, but he would have the most fun in the business. He would have mm. all these um, stagiaires, all these, uh, how do you say, people that work for free for- Interns. Uh, interns. All these interns, uh, quite a big warehouse space. Uh, he would have all these interns doing the work for free, just for <laughs> experience. And he would just party with them on Fridays. They would have their own hookah lounge and he would really make the work fun. Ah. So I thought like, okay, we could have done this as well <laughs> instead of just the two of us. Don't sell boxes. anymore. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this guy bought the company for for pennies. And it was really pennies. cheap, really cheap. But good, we finished the, the chapter. Onto the other stuff. Onto, onto the, the new, next one. Yeah, onto the next one. So you were gonna say that before, and then I cut you off. So th the next one was after the bachelors, after Sweden as well. Yeah, after Sweden. Uh, Sweden was the end of the bachelors. So uh, after Sweden, I came back to the Netherlands, um, then decided on, on, on the masters in Maastricht, mm -hmm. uh, went there. And I don't think I had a business there. Yeah, I was part of, of a business uh, of a friend of mine, Peter, you know him? Yep. Um, <laughs> he started IT Effect. So that was building, building websites for uh, web shops for brick and mortar stores. So we would 
basically what year was this do you remember um year of the masters 2014 2015 i think 2014 already it's still a pretty good time to be building websites for people because there weren't a ton of people around doing it you could charge a decent amount so um you would think so yeah Oh, really? He weren't able to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wasn't doing it, but I knew people who did, so. Yeah. Was, uh, it was just a fun, fun adventure to, to, uh, to keep, in, keep staying involved in, in small businesses. So then I realized, like, I don't have to own the business to, to really enjoy it. I can also be part of a small team, um, don't even have shares, but still, I would like having, uh, making an impact. So being responsible for the growth of this whole business. That's what I, that's what I also enjoyed. So yeah. for me, it was quite unclear. Do I really want to, do I really want to start my own business or do I, would I just enjoy it as much working for a startup? Uh, so I was thinking about this the whole time during my, during my masters. Um, so end of the masters, um, I stopped working for the, for that company that built web shops for the brick and mortar stores. Um, and then I moved to Amsterdam, where I joined Bunk, the startup, ah. startup bank. It is now a unicorn since a few months ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. So joined that startup. And I thought, so something I would think I would really enjoy, um, I actually didn't enjoy. The, the startup life was really nice. The, the colleagues, all the people I met there, have, they had the exam the same exact mentality as what you described uh, laptops open work is fun you want to do it because you like it and not because you're earning money or you have uh, this many uh, holiday vacation days yeah, or yeah. this many benefits whatever everyone earned next to nothing working there <laughs> and they still were happy as can be and, and motivated because they liked where the company was going so that for me I really enjoyed um, but yeah, there there has to be. Uh, if you're not getting compensated the money, you want to have some degree of freedom. You want to have something else, right? You want to have um, yeah, a level of appreciation and, yeah. or learning things as well. That was a very important part for many of those uh, many of the people working there, because everyone was already at the top of their position in the company. You would be head of uh, of data <laughs> i would be head of data how many people were there at that time when i joined 20 20 something wow and then it grew to 50 70 i uh, witnessed all the the growth also oh, that's a pretty unique yeah i mean like you said it just got valued over a billion dollars a yeah. few months ago so um and for you to be there in that around first 20 like not a lot of people get to experience the future unicorns at the time when it was just 20 people and it was even better than that no one knew what they did it was completely secret uh, even when 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 they um, reached out to me, like, would this be an interesting position for you? Their website was so mysterious. It mm. was nothing. I had to visit. Uh, after the first conversation, I didn't even know what it was. Then I had to sign NDA, and then they finally told me. Mm. And then I was really impressed and enjoyed I, I love the idea as well. Um, so just to give people a little bit of information, because yeah. um, I think all the Europeans listening will know Bunk, right? And so I think you told me before, Bunk was the first one that kind of came out with the Tiki functionality, right? Yeah, this is uh, something a lot of people, I think also the Europeans and the Dutch don't don't really know how all the, um, the Tiki, where it came from, the QR code that you see connecting the desktop with your mobile, that functionality, um, ING, payment requests, all the stuff basically do, to do with sharing and um, making it easier and more intuitive, a lot of that came from, from Bunk. Um, I would never say this with a lot of confidence if I didn't 100% believe it, but we were the, the office underneath ING. ING would share the elevator with us. They would <laughs> even ask for, try to probe us to give information no about what, what are you guys doing there? What are you guys doing there? <laughs> and um, we would keep everything extremely secret. But as soon as you launch something, so the QR code example is a good one. Um, we launched that functionality because it was mobile only. Yeah. So we needed a way for people to easily pay with their mobile phones when they purchase something on their desktop. So, okay, how do you connect these? How do you, what is the gateway QR code? Easy. Scan it and you see the, you see the approval message done. Really intuitive, worked perfect. We were extremely happy when when we uh, when it came out. Then a month or two later, ING came out with the same. 
Um, so that was the thing with Bunk. We we had a lot of features, a lot of ideas. People were really creative there. Uh, and there was such a lean organization. You could push whatever idea you had. Um, it would be launched in a few weeks. So for the, the Tiki example, you would have um, a payment request within Bunk. And you could send it to anyone. doesn't matter what bank they have. And they could pay with Ideal. But the one sending it had to have Bunk. And that ah. was a bit of the, um, the issue. So you would first need to open a bank account, then you would be able to actually send a payment request. While with Tiki, you can, doesn't matter, right? You can, uh, you yeah. don't have to have, what's it, Abiy and or Rabobank? You it, don't have to have it. You yeah. can send it to you anyone. You see the you, Tiki app. Well, so that's it. I'm going to explain this for the Americans listening because, or I guess also the Brits as well. But uh, so first of all, in America, like we, it's, I think it's gotten a little easier now. This is how actually the Cash App has become so huge. I don't know if you know the Cash App, but Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, he also yeah. started um, Square. And so with Square, which is a payment service provider and also financing and all this other stuff, they then started this kind of um, thing called the Cash App, which is basically like this app to pay people money, which was kind of revolutionary because in the US, we do not have an easy like system for sending each other money you mm -hmm. have paypal which is a little bit difficult you, they both have to have a paypal account and all this stuff and then they made it to where you could send it to a, a bank account but then there's the fee and all this stuff and then venmo venmo kind of became yeah, semi venmo. popular and then i think paypal may have bought venmo i'm not really sure how it is now but when i came to the netherlands six years ago or something I mean, Ideal was such a huge like change for me and the easiest payment system I had ever yeah, seen. I mean, I can't explain to the Americans listening now what Ideal is, except for that it's a, just a super seamless, easy payment system that every bank uses, every merchant uses. Like, it's just incredibly, insanely easy for every payment. You don't need your debit card. You don't need a credit card. Like, just super easy link to your bank account. So anyway, when I first came here, the Dutch are very big on splitting every check, you know what I mean? And they don't do it to where if you go to a restaurant here or you go to a bar and there's like seven or eight of you in the US, you could say split the check by eight, split the check by six. And that's everybody does it. You know what I mean? They bring you literally eight receipts to give each of you the one. So the ones at the restaurant are responsible for splitting it, not you. Yeah. The restaurant splits yeah. up the checks and then they take eight cards back with them. They scan like it's not a good Crazy. process, but it is the way that it is. And we do appreciate the ability to kind of like split the check or whatnot. But then you're at the Netherlands, and you're out drinking with a bunch of buddies and it's like the bill's 200 and it's like, okay, who's going to pay? You know what I mean? Like that was a huge difference for me. But anyway, you had this app when I first came here called Tiki. Mm -hmm. And so if you, which is, I think AB and AMRO owns um, yeah. Tiki, but you, AB and AMRO is a bank here, but you don't have to have an AB and AMRO account. You could link this app Tiki to your bank. And then what you could do is you could send a request for like five, six, however many people you want to pay that divided portion. So I could send everybody a Tiki for eight euros, 10 people pay it. I get 80 euros back. Right. Yeah. So at that time, Tiki, you had to download Tiki to be able to do that. Then soon after that, ING came out with the ING payment request, which is the same thing. Also, this QR code thing is also super easy, right? Because you're going there to pay for something on your laptop. It says, choose your bank. You choose ING. It shows you a QR code with your phone. You pick it up. You scan the QR code. Payment done. Yeah, fingerprint. That's it. Fingerprint if you want. Face ID. You threw it with your phone. However it is that you have it set up, it's done. No debit card. No credit card. Like, all this kind of stuff, similar to a PayPal, but again, so, so much easier than using then, PayPal. then, like you said, yeah, you need PayPal to use PayPal. And this exactly, this is everything. with your bank. This yeah. is literally from your bank, yeah. So what he's saying here about Bunk, which is B-E-U-N-Q, Bunk is yeah. like the, the idea that they kind of created this, what was that, four years ago or... Uh, I think so. Yeah. Four or five years ago. The idea that they were the ones and you're in this office with the like 20 or so people who are kind of at the foundation yeah, of that was cr yeah. creating this thing that basically rapid, I mean, uh, like radically changed the payment landscape of Europe as a whole, definitely the Netherlands. Like that's crazy that you were there in that office. That it was, we didn't realize that that's not the way you're describing it, but it's kind of cool to having witnessed all the, those innovations. But at the moment we knew that was the, that's the bad part about it. We knew as soon as we would launch it, it would get copied Yeah, for sure. So that was the whole, the hard part, the tricky part about Bunk, like how are we going to really distinguish ourselves from the competition in a long-term way that they cannot copy? Um, Difficult always to do when you're going up against INGs and people with that kind of money. Exactly. And they're not, especially ING is not a typical old-fashioned bank where no innovation happens. They do have their 
own big innovation center and they're really happy to bring in new new ideas as well so it's uh it's tough competition as well but yeah the 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 the, the ideal method in combination with with tiki works perfectly so in in america you have revolut as well is that something like cash app uh well revolut's um uk based so Ah, it's not US based. They, I think they're UK based. Yeah, they weren't in the US when I was there, so I don't know if it's there now because I've been gone so long. But, <laughs> but um, no, I don't think we have Revolut there. Maybe now we do if they've expanded, you know. But um, no. And Venmo didn't never caught up. Never v- Venmo, I think semi caught on, but it wasn't like ubiquitous. If you know what I mean, like it wasn't everybody has it kind of deal. It would it would be like, hey, do you have Venmo? Can I send it to you in that way? But like even the idea that people had to get a Venmo to to send each other money, like compared to the Netherlands where it's just like, you just need their, their bank account number and you can just transfer it. And it's like with like instantly, you know, and then it's in their bank. And yeah, I think that's the, that's the secret that they just build a portal to some, so to connect something people already had just build like a gateway between it, connecting it. It doesn't sound as like when I, when I say this and then I'm sure there's going to be people who listen to us and like, Oh, you look, it's been gone too long. Like that's the same as this thing. It's the same as that thing. I'm telling you, like, I can't explain how easy it is. How easy it is. Verbally. You know what yeah. I mean? Cause it's just like the whole, the whole process of payments in the Netherlands. Can like, we show it? No, it's beautiful. It. I might can show it in the editing later, you know, yeah. like pop in a video or something, but, um, uh, no, it's super easy to make payments here. Venmo is, I think Cash App though now, Cash App is now becoming this huge, probably future unicorn as well for that reason, because this payment landscape is so fractured in the US compared to here. And I saw this lady from the UK kind of give a talk about it once where she said that the reason why it's easier to do like, um, remember when Apple Pay was rolled out here and it was such a big deal, like now you could pay with your phone, pay with your watch and all that stuff. But it just happened basically overnight because you have this kind of, what do you call like centralized banking system where all the banks have to operate into the same protocols and the same stuff. Yeah. So basically if you want to develop Apple pay, you develop it for all the banks and not just, you know, one or two, cause they all use the same centralized like protocol. The UK is pretty similar to that. So they had wireless, you know, like, you know, with your card where you could do the wireless payments and stuff. I think mm. the UK was one of the first ones to kind of implement that. But because the U S is so big with 50 different States and, you know, tons of different banks and whatever, like it's not as centralized as it is here. So it's much more difficult to kind of get that change to happen. But it's just silly that the cash app is now this hugely valuable company that here it would never be successful because there's literally no need for it. There's no need for it. No need for it. It's so easy to transfer people money here and to track your money and do all these things. Like you'd never need an app (laughs) to do that. That's what I've always also been thinking. Like when, Five years ago or something, no, oh, seven years ago, when I first came into the world of crypto and all the uh, digital payments that you could do with crypto, I didn't really see it getting or getting being a success in the Netherlands for payments mm. because everything is already so smooth. And now, the further we are with the Tiki and how you pay in the in the store, it's crazy. You just tap your card, tap your watch, tap your phone. Doesn't matter. You don't need something like uh, crypto to to handle payments. So it has another use case, but <laughs> so what was that? What was that story? How did you uh, originally get, um, cause you first got some Bitcoin like years ago, right? Before it was, you were like the people who paid for pizza with it and didn't know that it was going to be <laughs> so expensive. You know what I mean? Like how did you guys end uh, up? My, my roommate was, was that guy that uh-huh. paid, for, <laughs> paid for pizza with Bitcoin when it was two cents. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say that part was 100% luck. Um, because I was living with the, the guy next door in, in Groningen. Uh, nice word for all the Americans watching Groningen. Groningen. <laughs> the, <laughs> see how, how good your pronunciation has become. Um, so the, the guy living next door to me, a good friend uh, of mine as well, he, um, he was telling me like, yeah, man, he was following these Reddit forums all, mm, all the time. Reddit, it always starts <laughs> on Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't really know Reddit. I thought this was like this big nerd uh, get together on, on the internet. It still is. is. <laughs> but now I start to appreciate it way more. Um, after I discovered I was a nerd myself. Of course. Um, <laughs> As we do. <laughs> <laughs> As we do later in life. Um, so this guy was telling me, man, I should have bought Bitcoin. Uh, should have bought it a year ago, man. It was only two cents. Now it's already five dollars. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Dear God. Five dollars. Then, then it still took me a long time. I only bought when it was 
three hundred dollars or something. So I I passed the whole not a bubble before I finally got to it. But I think a lot of people you have to tell them about Bitcoin first, then they see like a bubble, they see it pass, and then they decide, okay, now it's time for me gotta to wait for the dip. Step in. Yeah, yeah, gotta yeah. wait for the dip. Um, so then I I I bought it. Um, and it's really, I noticed it with everyone that first buys it, it's like a fire you want to spread. It's like starting a new diet. <laughs> you want to talk to as many people as, uh, people who become vegan, they want to yeah, share yeah, it with yeah. everyone. As annoying as it gets. Um, so now I only talk about it with people I that ask about it. I don't do it out of myself anymore. But at that time I was this annoying kid uh, telling everyone about, about Bitcoin, how it would go to, should have told me. Why didn't you tell me? I know we didn't know each other, but come on. <laughs> <laughs> Should have called you. Why didn't anybody tell me? Any of my friends? Why were none of you Bitcoin geniuses? I'm so mad. So this, getting into Bitcoin, 100% luck. Um, but sticking with it and really making it an obsession <laughs> during my whole master's. Now I, now I think about it. That was my, uh, that, would, that was what took up my time. Mm. Not my own business because I quit that. Uh, but really diving deep into um, to the technology. It always sounds so... I mean it for the tech. But <laughs> <laughs> I was earning uh, money from it Just read Playboy well. for the jokes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I realized two things. One, staring at graphs does not make you happy. Two, earning enough money for uh, freedom, a certain amount of freedom, does make you very happy. So uh, I needed something that would give me financial freedom, um, which did not involve staring at graphs 14 hours a day. So um, I, I didn't want to do anything with trading anymore. Oh, so you were trading Bitcoin. You weren't just like buying it and then holding no, it. No, I was actually, it. I was trading with, with big, like I, I, I was there when the, when the leverage came out. First, you couldn't buy or sell with, with leverage. Um, so you could only, if you had a hundred bucks, you could buy a hundred bucks worth of, of Bitcoin. Then suddenly one exchange, a shady Chinese exchange called OKCoin, they came out with 100 times leverage. So Ooh, wow. suddenly instead of 100 bucks, I would have $10,000 I could invest. Jeez. Not thinking about the consequences that I could also lose this 100 bucks 10 times faster. So I would just go hard. Uh, really hit the button and and see where it would bring me. Um, made a lot of money fast. Lost it all in in a week. Um, so then I discovered, yeah, uh, I don't feel particularly happy about making a lot of money, and I don't feel really sad about losing it. So mm. I think that was for me also uh, quite a good mindset to have while while trading. I wasn't emotionally connected to the to the earnings, so I could take it on a position. Uh, not look for it, not, not look at it for a long time, or I could uh, really be involved in it, but don't really care if if I lost uh, lost money or if I gained a lot of money. Wouldn't act different different because of it. Right. So uh, I think that did help me with uh, sticking with it for the longer term. Um, really finding a strategy as well, uh, and, and just seeing it more as a um, uh, as a part I didn't want, but also didn't need to put as much time in. Just had to find a strategy, stick with it, don't look at it too much. And then I was on to uh, other things that mattered more to me. So didn't want to make this my main thing in, in life. But so you did like make enough money to then, did you use that when you started the Amazon business? Like, Yeah, correct. So um, I made enough money. To, so you're not, you're not a Bitcoin billionaire. I'm not a Bitcoin billionaire. <laughs> I wasn't even, I wasn't a millionaire. It was, uh, it was enough to buy big amount of inventory <laughs> no but man these people th these people who like you talk about michael Saylor and all the miami people it's like all oh, these people it's just like kind of went from nothing to insanely rich yeah. from crypto and i think like i don't think anything since maybe the gold rush or the oil rush and stuff like that have we seen so many <sighs> people go from literally nothing like imagine if you're one of those people that you bought it at three dollars fifty cents five dollars and you just bought a shit ton and then you hold it I mean, that's insane, the amount of explosion of wealth that's happened in such a short time. It's bringing a whole new group of elites, the crypto elites. New money. New money. And it's, yeah, you're right. It's incomparable to anything that has been there in the in the past. Maybe penny stocks. They There were some that went like 
X hundred. I guess the dot com boom. There were some people, yeah. but still, I don't think as maybe as much as this. Like, no. what's it at now? And 60K? so many bubbles, bubbles, yeah. bubbles. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not one bubble boom and bust. It's it goes, it goes, it goes. Um, and there's a solid case for that as well. I believe. Uh, I'm not gonna go into no, no, no. The, I understand. In, in, yeah. Into depth about that one, but um, what do I want to say? The whole new people of yeah. So many of those people that got insanely wealthy. Uh, it reminded me of when I first made, when I turned a hundred bucks into a couple of K, uh, it, it went so fast. If it goes so fast and you don't really know how you earned that money, you also don't know how to keep it and you're going to, yeah. m- just as quickly, you're going to lose it all. So many of the, the people that got their wealth, for example, this year during this bubble, I believe 90% will also lose it. If you got it from a previous bubble or the one before that, and uh, you experienced the whole bear market, everything, you're much more likely mm. to keep it as well. Because you you need to know how, <laughs> you need to know why uh, why you got that that money. If you don't know how you got it, you don't know how to how to keep it. I think a lot of people are just um, buying crypto and trying to diversify a little bit, and then just hold on to it and forget about it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like just for me, I haven't been disciplined enough to just kind of keep adding to it because it's just like I don't feel that comfortable with it the only reason I even did it in the first place is because I felt um the FOMO you know what I mean like I was like everybody else is doing this that's dangerous but then you're feeling the same FOMO when it goes down everyone's stepping out I'm not (laughs) yeah what I what I kind of decided is I have a little bit of this um thing where I've been watching this uh funny show on Netflix called uh how to sell drugs online fast (laughs) and it's a German show and these kids like they they kind of you know build this uh first they start on the dark net they build this site they're selling drugs here in Europe um and then they kind of move it to the regular internet but it's so encrypted and so whatever that the cops can't even catch them or whatever But when they're talking about all this stuff with like, of course, all the stuff is done with Bitcoin, like all the transactions and um, they use blockchain and all these different encrypted hacks and whatever, Mm. like that I don't even understand. But I feel a little bit like I'm only 30, right? When I was coming up, the internet was around, like we were learning the code, we were doing these things. I almost feel like I should go on like a six month boot camp or something. Sell drugs. (laughs) And learn all these new technologies that are around. That way I can get my arms around them and not be left behind by this new generation of tech that's going to be here for years. So that's what I was going to say. If you, um, if you, if I hear people say, I want to invest something in crypto, but I don't feel comfortable about it. It's most of the time it's about not knowing enough about it that you trust it. So uh, you need and just learn. You're a guy that wants to dive deep into stuff that you find interesting, but do you find crypto interesting enough that you're going to really go, de- would you go deep into it and, and really learn how it works, what well, the math is behind it? The thing that, that um, for me is that I find the uh, actual technology interesting. I find the multiple use cases for it interesting. When you separate that from the value of the asset Mm -hmm. totally unrelated to me because like the entire um, price of let's say all these different cryptos is at the moment set on what people are expecting it to be worth at some point in the future, which is totally unknown, unknowable, right? It's like all this stuff is kind of based on this projection of how used it will be, how widespread and all this kind of stuff. So there's no, in my opinion, there's no fundamental basis that you can point to and say, this is why Bitcoin costs 60,000. I don't know. You can say, oh, it's limited supply, blah, blah, blah. Like, I do not think that you can make a real, you know, case to say that it's based on fundamentals. It's very speculative, right? Yeah. So I still want to learn a lot more about it and kind of dive in or whatnot, but I don't think what I've learned so far actually gives me enough uh, validation to make me feel like it's in, in, worthy investment per se speculation that's the only reason why i bought any is because it's just a hey put that money there forget about it Mm. if it blows up it blows up so would you feel the same about gold for example well see that's interesting right because it's the same thing gold is about the value that we put on it the difference is gold is tangible you know what i mean like at the end of the day if bitcoin crashes and you have some bitcoin on a disc yeah, okay, it's there. It's on a disc, but you can't touch it. You can't feel it. You can't. So the whole thing about touching it makes the makes a difference for you. Well, because if you buy gold, you would most likely not go 
buy a physical brick of gold, you would invest it in some fund that would have a gold repository. I would probably yeah do a do a yeah something like that, and I wouldn't actually invest in gold uh, itself. But I think the difference is like they can't. Yeah, you could mine more gold, but I mean. For the most part, like there are fundamentals tied to gold. There's a supply. There's where we know that it might be in the world. You have expeditions. They try to discover more, whatever. Like there's uses for it and all this kind of stuff. Like gold is kind of an asset that you can give a fundamental value to based on people's willingness to pay. Um, it's the same. But it has with, no use. You cannot use it for anything except for jewelry. Yeah, I mean, but it, that's that's the right. It does have a use. Is that the jewelry is a big one? Dishes or whatever, kind of like. Uh, gold plated this and that you know what i mean like there's yeah. tons of demand for gold in the world because of but the this lugs, demand of luxury the, this utility demand is not where it gets this multi multi-billion dollar market cap from. yeah it's i think the it's the exclusivity factor for gold probably is um, yeah so so if if i hear you then okay bitcoin um maybe isn't for you to you either trust the whole math behind it uh, there's a limited supply it's not tangible as in physically, but it is a piece of code that you would have and it would show that you are the owner uh, and you can actually prove that you own that piece of, of Bitcoin. So it's just as right. much I'd... tangible as, as gold. But aside from that, what I do think you would find uh, interesting, what I find very interesting as well, is um, all the, the other coins, in particular um, Ethereum, there's another one. I own the Ethereum same. and Litecoin. Okay. I like Litecoin. Let's not talk about Litecoin. You don't like Litecoin? <laughs> no, or no? I don't like Litecoin. Oh, you don't? It's like Bitcoin is gold, Litecoin is silver. That's it. Oh. No use for it in I any thought, other way. I thought Litecoin had better tech. But. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Ethereum is... Um, that's, my, that's my biggest crypto holdings. Ethereum. It is? Yeah. Okay. Good man. Good man. <laughs> the, the, they are building actual utility on digital platforms, uh, lending platforms, money... <laughs> whole new financial systems they're building uh tokenized assets so you can you can exchange artwork i can buy this uh, michael jordan michael jordan uh poster from you if you were the creator i could show hey i, I bought this poster from the actual creator of it uh, it now holds value all this stuff is really just in the in the early stages yeah and this you're never late there's yeah. always something new there's yeah. always something new so i believe if you dive deep into this uh, tech of the the other coins that are coming up, then there's such a whole world. I, I've been looking at this this world for over uh, nine years now, since 2012, and every week there's something new I discover, something you can really go deep into. It's crazy. Yeah. So um, and also with the NFTs and stuff like that, like yeah, that's, that's not that about. different. Yeah, exactly yeah. what you're talking about, basically. But that's not far removed from crypto and all these other things. So that's another one of those things where it's, I feel like I just need to get with the times in a way. And it feels weird to say that as a 30 year old. Get with the times, Lucas. You know what I mean? But it's like, <laughs> I don't want to sound 75 when I'm, you know, like, them trying to find out where a cassette player is, you know. <laughs> but I I do know where the feeling comes from because all the guys as well in the in the crypto scene, man, they are what seventeen year old kids building crazy stuff, <sighs> and they're gonna leave us all behind. Half your age because I hope they're all <laughs> socialists, <laughs> <laughs> so they're willing to have really nice old folks' homes that <laughs> <I don't think laughs> we, so. we can all enjoy. Yeah.